Today we're going to be learning Pesachim Daf Zayin. This is the Daf for Shabbat. Um, a week of learning beginning today is dedicated by Audrey Mandro for the seventh year side of her father, Irving Papi Moskov, Yechezkel ben Avraham Verachel, Zichrono Levracha, who taught us with his complete and munah faith in Hashem, who is rich, one who is content with his lot. My dad considered himself extremely rich. May his neshama have an aliyah. And today's Daf is dedicated by Natalie Taylor in honor of Jordi Hyman, a wonderful friend, doctor, and Talmidah Chachama. Happy birthday. We are going to start exactly at the beginning of the Daf. So we ended at the previous Daf with this question, why do we do Bitul at the time that we do B'dikat Chametz, right? When we check for Chametz, why is that the time that we do Bitul? Why wouldn't you say, Niv So we had, first we started with, why don't you say, um, why don't we do it later? And we said, because um, if you did it later, we were worried if you wait till four or five hours, it's not Zman Isur, Velav Zman Biura, right? It's not yet forbidden and it's not the time to burn the chametz yet. So maybe people will forget and won't end up doing it. Then they say, Vinif to leave a sheet. So why don't you do it? At the, so Rashi says we need the beginning of the sixth hour because at that point, that's when you're supposed to burn the chametz and that would be a good time. And yet it's not yet, the Isr chametz hasn't kicked in yet. Because remember, once it's forbidden, you're not, you can't cancel it because it doesn't belong to you to the extent that you can't cancel it. You can't nullify it. So they say, Well, the reason is, since by rabbinic law it's forbidden, therefore we don't allow you to do it it's, it's as if it's, it's not in your Rashut anymore. It's as if it's not in your domain. Just like when it's forbidden by Torah law, it's not in your domain, even when it's forbidden by rabbinic law. And that's because we saw, as we'll see later in the upcoming Mishnah, that there's a debate about exactly what time one can eat chametz in the morning by rabbinic law. So therefore, and that's before that, it's not really forbidden yet. And there's no real noticeable differentiation. And once it's done, even if we were to do it when we burn it, it's already by rabbinic law, not part of our reshut. The Amar of Gidel Bar Yosef, uh, Amar of Gidel Amar of Yichir Bar Yosef. Here we're going to prove this. Amar Rav, he said in the name of Rav. Hamikadesh mishesh shaodu lamala afilu bechite kordenita ein choshesin lekidushin. So now we say, if you um, betroth the woman from sheshaot, which sounds like Rashi says, from the beginning of sheshaot. In other words into the sixth hour, which means really we're talking about 11.01 in the morning. So if you're Mekadesh Isha, you take chametz and you betroth the woman with chametz. Okay, now we're going to talk about what kind of chametz. Afilu b'chitei kordinita. Even chitim, okay, Rashi says, what are these chitim kordinita? Hatsumchim b'hare ararat. They grow in the Mount Ararat region. Kashim hem ma'od. They're very hard. The idea is if water gets into them, they don't really get absorbed because they're very hard and there's no real concern that they're going to leaven. However, we still don't allow it. In other words, we say in this case, even though when it comes to Safe Kiddushin, we're not sure, maybe someone betrothed someone, we're very strict because we're talking about serious things. If a woman's married to someone or designated to someone here, it's not marriage, but it's Kiddushin, which is the first stage of marriage that we now, it's kind of like engagement, betrothal. We do it now all at once, but they used to do it much earlier. And already at that point, the woman is committed to that man. And if she sleeps with somebody else, it's, she's an Eshadish. Okay. That's called Ni'uf, adultery. So we're very stringent when it comes to Suffolk Kiddushin. And in this case, we don't even say there's a Suffolk. You clearly, the man clearly betrothed her with nothing. Okay. We don't count it because it couldn't be that he owned them, right? Remember at a wedding, they always asked, you own the ring. The, the husband has to have ownership over whatever it is he's betrothing her with. So now we say, Ula batari sura. Um, okay, so now we're going to question. So we basically established that we do the beetle at night because we can't do it early in the morning because people might forget. We can't do it later in the morning because it's already forbidden by rabbinic law. And we see that also from Kiddushin, from the, the case of the betrothal. But now we say, Really? You can't nullify it after it's already forbidden? Vahatanya, here we're going to see a case where it sounds like you can. Haya Midrash, Chametz Beto, 
אחד השבת, אחד שבת ואחד יום טוב. Okay, let's start from the end. Whether it's Shabbat or whether it's Yom Tov, if you're in a situation where you're sitting in the Beit Midrash learning, and then you realize, you remember that you have chametz in your house, what do you do? Mivatlo bilibo. You nullify it in your heart. Now, what does this sound like? Sounds like you could do it even on Shabbat, even on Yom Tov. So let's see. Bishlama Shabbat, mishkachala kegon shechala ra'asar liyop Shabbat. The Shabbat when I get, you could say this all happened before Pesach. We're talking about Shabbat was your dalid. You realize you have this chametz in your house. It's still the morning. You nullify it. That could work. But, ala yom tov, but tari sukahu, but yom tov. Obviously, we're not talking about on Sukkot. We're obviously talking about but Pesach. Once it's Pesach, you can't nullify it. Didn't we just say that? So how could you possibly do this? So, am rabach, am Yaakov, hacha betamid yoshev lefnei rabor askinan. Well, notice what it said there. He's sitting in the Beit Midrash. He must be sitting in front of his rabbi. Now, why is that significant? Well, the idea is that you're in the middle of learning and you can't stop learning. It's an embarrassment to your teacher. It's not kavod for the Torah. You can't stop. So what's the situation? So let's see. Nizkar sheyesh isa megulgele betoch beto. Umitiare shema tachmitz. And therefore, kadem umavatrele mikame de tachmitz. It's actually not chametz yet. If it were chametz, then we go back to what we said originally. You can nullify that. But this, in fact, is not chametz. What's the situation? It's a dough that was needed, but hasn't yet, and it could be for matzah. But what happened? And that's why it's on Yom Tov. But you forgot about it at home. You left it. It's interesting. We would have thought the women were all involved in this. It seems the men were involved in making the matzah. You left it in your house. You went to the Beit Midrash and all of a sudden you remembered, forgot about my dough. So it hasn't yet leavened. That's why you're allowed to nullify it. Okay, now why don't you just go home and deal with it? So that's why they say it must be someone in the Beit Midrash because if he's in the Beit Midrash, he can't leave the Beit Midrash to go take care of it. Okay, at least it's one example, right? It could be another example. It could be you just won't make it in time, right? It's too late at that point, especially when we're talking, you don't have a lot of time. So anyway, that's the case where you can nullify it, but it's not a case where you actually have chametz. Daikanami de Katani, and you can further prove this because it says, Haya Yoshe Betok Beit Midrash, Maminan. That's why this explanation makes sense because it actually says you were in the Beit Midrash, and that's why we can explain it in this way. Because it must be a situation. The idea is it's specifying that, not just to explain a potential situation, but they're doing it to say that's a case where you wouldn't necessarily, like, we want you to get back in time, but you can't because you're, right? you could also say, by the way, you were just outside your house. You weren't in your house. If you were in your house, you obviously could deal with it before it leavens. Now we're going to have a case of you open your bread basket. Okay, we're going to assume that you have, let's say, a drawer that you use for bread. On Pesach, you use it for matzah. You open it up in the middle of Pesach, and what do you find there? Moldy bread. Now, what's the case here? What do they say? We don't know yet whether the bread is chametz or not, although hold off on that question. Kevan sheravta matzah muteret. If the majority was matzah, then it's allowed. Now, we don't exactly know what exactly this means. Let's, let's see. Hey, chidami, what's the case? If you know it's chametz, then ki ravta matzah may have it. What does it matter if most of what's in that drawer is matzah? It shouldn't make any difference. It's chametz, and therefore you obviously can't eat it. Ella, or, you know, you also have to burn it. Ella, obviously you don't really want to be eating this. It's moldy anyway. Ella de lo yadina ba i chametzi hi hu i matzah it must be you don't know if it's chametz or if it's matzah. So you find this moldy bread and you don't know its status. So now they say, if you want to say that's the case, my area ki rav tamatzah. Afilu ki lo rav tamatzah nami nezo batar batra. Now wait, that also doesn't make sense because it shouldn't matter is the majority of the bread in the basket matzah. It should matter what was the last thing that was in the drawer, as we're going to see in a minute. Milo Tnan doesn't it say, now the assumption here is that if you have a bread drawer that you use for bread during the year, and then you use it for matzah on Pesach, if the last thing that went in that drawer was matzah, what are we going to assume? We are going to assume that you cleaned out that drawer and there was nothing in there when you put the matzah in. That's what it means we go after the last thing in the drawer. Because in a situation where you generally clean out one thing, making room for the other, like chametz and matzah, 
Therefore, we can assume it was matzah. So again, why does it have to be kevan sheravta matzah? It shouldn't be that. But let's explain how we know that we go achar batcha. And for this, we're going to talk about maser sheni. Maser sheni is money that you're supposed to take a tenth of your produce and you're supposed to bring it to Jerusalem and eat it in Jerusalem. But it was very schleppy to carry all these fruits. So people would redeem it onto a coin, take the coin to Jerusalem. And in Jerusalem, you'd use that coin. That coin has sanctity to it until you redeem it. In Jerusalem, you buy either produce with it that you eat in Jerusalem, or many people would buy animals to sacrifice. They would bring sacrifices on the holiday and they would buy animals with it. So when you bought the animal, what happens or the, or the produce? That produce has sanctity to it. Then you would eat it in Jerusalem, right? If it's, let's say the fruit, you would eat it in Jerusalem or sacrifice it at the temple. And when you did that, the money reverted back to being unsanctified money, chulin. So let's read this Mishnah. Milo Tznan does it not say in the Mishnah. If you have money that you find right near where they're selling animals in the in Jerusalem, we're going to assume now, the question is, we don't know, is it Maser, is it not Maser? Well, there's about a 50-50 chance. Why? Because if the money was already spent in Jerusalem for the animals, it's the assumption is the majority of the money. Now, here's an interesting assumption. What happens is, let's say, I forgot to mention, if you get to Jerusalem and you don't manage to use all your master shani money, what did people generally do with it? They would sell it for probably less than it was valued because they want to get rid of it. The, the, the supply is great, all this money. So the people, the locals, would buy that Maser money for less, okay? And they would then use it because the people in Jerusalem can always buy food in Jerusalem all year long. The people who are going back home have nothing to do with the money. So basically, they would sell it off before they left, which means that the majority of the money spent in Jerusalem during the year even, not even during the time of the holidays, was Maser Shani money. So, and particularly, the people would buy animals with them. So if you find the people who are selling animals and they have money on the floor there, the it's a 50-50 chance that the money fell from the buyers or the money fell from the seller. If the money fell from the buyer, then it's still Master Shani money and it's sanctified. If it fell from the seller, then remember what happens. You pay the money and the money, the sanctity goes onto the animal and goes off of the money. So then the money's not sanctified anymore. So if you find it before the Sochare Behema, right where they're selling them, Lo'olam Maser, you have to treat it as Maser because there's a good, because it's a Safek to Oraita, we don't know, and it's Torah law. Therefore, we're going to hold, we're going to be stringent and think that it's sanctified. But Baharabayit Chulim, but in Harabayit itself, we're assuming it's going to be Chulim because first of all, many people did not bring their money into Harabayit. It's usually after they spent their money. So we don't assume that money in Harabayit is going to be sanctified. If you find it just anywhere in the city or in the in the shuk in the city, we're going to assume. Depends on when it is. If it's the time of the regal, the time of the holidays, we're going to assume it's maser. If it's any other day of the year, we're going to assume it's chulin. So now they want to know why are we making this distinction between the Harabayit and the Shat and the and the Shuk? And why do we have this? There was this assumption that they would clean the streets of Jerusalem every day. Okay. Therefore, if they clean them every day, that means any money that was left got collected. And therefore, Alma Amrina and Kamai Kama Azele. Okay, so now, what's the assumption? We're going to say the ones from before were obviously swept up already because they got swept every day. And the ones that are left, right, must be new ones. So when it's the holiday, the majority of the money being spent on the holiday is Master Shani money. When it's not a holiday, we're not going to assume it's Master Shani. During the year, they didn't necessarily all spend Master Shani. That was only by the Sochare Beheman, by the temple, but not otherwise. So therefore, we're going to assume, and this is the difference between Harabayit, okay? We're going to assume that whatever was there in Jerusalem got swept up already, and whatever we see now is new money, right? And so if it was during the holiday, then we're going to assume it's new money from today. If it's after the holiday, we're going to assume holiday money is no longer there because it got swept. 
Why was the Harabayat not swept every day? First of all, it could be it was less crowded. Also, people had to take off their shoes before getting into Harabayat. So maybe the floors were less dirty. Okay, for whatever reason, it's obvious that they didn't sweep the temp, the Harabayat every day. Okay, on a daily basis. It's interesting. You get a little bit of insight into, wait till we learn Shkalim and you learn about really the ins and outs, but you get a little insight into their lives. The Shukei Yerushalayim, they were swept every day, right? Remember when I lived in Jerusalem, they definitely were not cleaning the streets on a daily basis. In fact, there were lots of garbage strikes and uh, they, the, often the streets were full of garbage. But in those days, they would sweep it every day. So now they say, oh, so what do you learn from here? Hachanami, we'd say the same thing here. Nema kama kama azil, vahai nahu. We could say the same thing. You clean out your bread drawer before Pesach. So whatever was the last thing that went in. And if it's still full of bread, then we assume you never cleaned it out for Pesach. Maybe you forgot that drawer. But if there was matzah in there, we assume that when the matzah went in, it was because the drawer had already been emptied. So what are the answer? Wait a minute. We were talking about moldy bread. How long is Pesach that your bread would have gotten so moldy on Pesach itself? It doesn't make so much sense. You have to remember their matzahs were, were, um, were not the hard matzahs that we have. They were probably the soft ones that are more pita-like. They could actually get moldy, but it would take them a few days. So therefore, since it's moldy, it seems to indicate that it was from a while ago, which means there's a likelihood. And maybe that's why you have to wait. And it's normally we'd say kama kama, right? That, or batra. We're going to go by the last thing that went in. But in this case, since it's moldy, we're going to assume it might have been moldy from before. But now they say, well, then we're back to square one. Again, why would it help if the majority is matzah, if you're going to say it's moldy? And moldiness indicates it was here for a while, which means it was probably here before Pesach. And it's probably chametz. And what does it help you if the majority is matzah? So I'm a rabbi. Lo tema sheravta matzah. Oh, you misunderstood. It's not that there was more matzah in the drawer than chametz. Ela ema sherabu yimei matzah ilave. It's that you had a lot of days of matzah already. If you already were more into the holiday, you weren't on day number one or two or three, but you've already had the majority of the days of Pesach pass, then we can assume that the moldy matzah, the moldy bread might be matzah because it's already gotten moldy. So they say, Ihachi pshita, but that's also pretty obvious. It didn't need to be stated. So they say, Lo it's if it's very moldy, right? You've all seen that kind of bread. Sometimes it's just got a little bit of mold growing on it, and sometimes it's really disgusting. Like you forgot a, a sandwich in your kid's knapsack, right? All through summer vacation, let's say. And you find that bread, it's really disgusting. Can't possibly be only five days old. So now they're going to say, no, you could still maybe assume that it's matzah. Why? You might have thought, since it's really, really moldy, it's obvious that it's, ma- that it's chametz. No. It's very likely that what you do, Every day you made matzah and you put the matzah while it was warm into the drawer. Now there's a way to speed up mold, right? If you put warm matzah into your drawer and you close it that and it's sitting right next to chametz, that's going to make that matzah get mold, that matzah get moldy much quicker. So therefore it could possibly be that you have very moldy bread and it actually could still be matzah. And there's a fascinating halacha that comes out of this, which is that really we follow this, that you can assume it's matzah, even though there's a doubt that maybe it's chametz, we actually treat it as matzah, which is really interesting because we're so stringent when it comes to chametz on Pesach, but yet here we see, we can follow the rules here that seem to indicate it's matzah. So now they say, wait a minute, do we really follow majority here? Oh, sorry, I said something wrong. The question is, sorry, this was all based on that we assume. Why can we make this assumption? Because we're going to assume that you cleaned out the drawer before Pesach and whatever's there now is goes by the last thing that was there. So now they're going to say, right, and, and again, this is as long as you're in the end part of the holiday. So we're going to go by 
batra, the last thing that went in there. If the last thing that went in there was matzah, we'll assume it's matzah. And that's what I said we paskin like. We can follow that rule and say we assume it's matzah. Okay, you find something in your bread drawer, you're not sure is it bread or matzah. Again, unlikely this would happen today. We have pretty clear distinction based on the matzahs that we make, although some people do still use soft matzahs, and that you can see that you would confuse it with pita, let's say. So if you find a moldy pita, which could potentially be a matzah. So do we really follow batra though? Let's, let's, let's look at the following source. So Rabbi Yosef Rabbi Huda says, if you have a box that you sometimes put Maser Shani money in it, and sometimes you put regular money in it. So now the question is, right? You don't know what it is. So what does it say? Ma'ot chulin and ma'ot maser. Im rov chulin chulin. Im rov maser maser. If the majority of the money that you see there is chulin, then it's chulin. If the majority is maser, then it's maser. Va'amai. Le'ezo batra batra. Why don't we go by the last thing that went in there? Again, we can assume that you're only keeping one or the other in there. And therefore, you're not going to use the same box and mix all your money. The money has no indicator what it is. Okay, although we're going to have to see what exactly the case is. So, Maybe it is a box that you mix them and you don't know which one you put in last. So that's a possibility. We're going to have three possibilities here. You had them in piles. And what happened? One dropped out of a pile and you don't know which pile it came from. So in other words, again, we started thinking that it only has one or the other. But now we say, no, 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 it actually has both. And either you somehow have them both all there and you're not sure which one went in last, or you use it for chulin and maaser, but you have them in piles and one fell off a pile and you don't know which one. Or, Rav Papa Amar Kegon de Ishtakach Beguma. Maybe it's found in a hole at the bottom of the box. So maybe now you're using it only for chulin, but it could be that it fell through some, like there's some, you know, area in the bottom that it could have fallen. And when you emptied the box, it didn't get emptied. And therefore we're, we're dealing with a suffix like that and we don't know. Okay, and that's why we don't follow Batra in that case, we follow Rov. Okay, but otherwise we really would follow Batra. Right, again, Batra means the last, the last thing that went in. Amar Rav Yudah. Now we're moving into a very interesting topic, and from here we're going to get into all sorts of interesting things about Brachot, about Shechianu, about Brachot HaMitzvah, um, all sorts of tangents. But we're starting with the main thing about when do you make a Bracha, what Bracha do you make on B'dikat Chametz? Okay, you would have thought, what Bracha do you make? Al B'dikat Chametz or Libdokat HaChametz. We're also going to get into what wording is used for blessings. So I'm going to review that. When you, bedik, when you do bedika, you have to make a bracha. So what's the bracha that you make? Rav Papa Amar Mishmei Derava, Liva El Chametz. Rav Papa Amar Mishmei Derava, Al Bior Chametz. So Rav Papi versus Rav Papa. They each say something in the name of Rava. It sounds very confusing because their names are very similar and they both say in the name of Rava. So the first opinion is Liva El, to burn the chametz. Rav Papa, Rav Papa says, "Al biur chametz." On okay, the on the idea of destroying the chametz. Okay, maybe I should say destroying, not burning. So first of all, note one thing: we don't say to check the chametz. That's because checking the chametz is really only in order to burn it. There's a few problems here. Why don't we say the bracha when we burn the chametz? If the idea is to destroy, it's true that Badika is getting ready for destroying, but it's not actually destroying. So basically, the way it's understood is that that bracha covers you for later, basically. You're making one bracha. Okay, we do this, by the way, on Purim. We make a shechianu in the morning on all the mitzvot of the day. It's a little bit different because it's not a bracha a mitzvah, but it's also a similar idea that you can make a bracha and it will apply to things later. So here also, we're making a bracha on Bi'or, which we're starting the process of Bidika and we're going to finish it. Right Then we do Bitul and then we're going to finish it when we burn the chametz. Uh, but now the question becomes what the debate of Liva'er or al Bior is. Okay, and the reason we don't make a bracha bedik al bedikat chametz is because that's not, the main mitzvah is l'hashbit, right? Tashbitu sa'ormi batechem, to get rid of the chametz. Bedika is just enabling us to get rid of it. The Liva'er kuleyam alopligi, the lashon, the, the language of Liva'er, everybody agrees, divada lahaba mashma. Liva'er means we are going to. It's about the future. So, in general, we make brachot, and we're going to talk about this before we do the act. So, you do this at the beginning of your checking. 
and then you check. So levaer, that seems like a good a good use, a good wording. Kipligi be albior. But the whole question is when you say albior, okay, and there's some mitzvot that we say le, like lahadlik ner shel Shabbat, okay, or lahadlik ner shel Chanukah, we're coming up on Chanukah. Um, but sometimes we say al, okay, and this sugya is going to get into the differences between le and al, and there's a whole debate about it. Um, so the machloket is ba'al bi'or. Mar savar mi'ikara mashma, umar savar lahaba mashma. So one holds, okay, which one? The one who said liva'el and not al bi'or, that's for puppy, says it's, it's, um, le sha'aval. Al means about what we already did, and we didn't do it yet, so we don't use that language. And li, right, would mean future. But Rav Papa, who says you can use the word al, he also thinks you could use liva'er, but he also says you could use al because al is also lahaba, about the future. So now we're going to bring a question. Metive. So the Gemara says, Baruch Hashir Kedisham Savitzivanu al hamila. Hatam hechi nema, nema lamul. Ah, so one, one second. Al hamila, period. That's the question. Al hamila sounds like on the mila, if you say it's about the past. Al hamila is about the past. No, we make a bracha alamila right before we do the mitzvah. So that doesn't make any sense. So they say, oh, well, that's a different reason. Hatam hechi nema, nema lamul. We're going to say, lamul. Now, what would be the problem with doing that? Losagia delav ihu mahil. They say, wait a minute, who says the bracha? I don't know if you paid attention, but the person who says, alamila is the moel. Now, the moel is not commanded to do the brimila. The father is commanded to do the brimila. So the Gemara says, okay, well then, Avi haben, ma'ikalameymar. Well then, what if it's the father who actually is commanded? In other words, what we're saying is there we had to change the, instead of lamul, we say alamila, because the person himself wasn't commanded. So when you're not commanded, you can't say, I was commanded to do the following thing. I wasn't commanded. But if it's the father who is commanded, and let's say he's the mohel, okay? Sometimes the father does the, the, the circumcision. So what do you say? Yeah, in fact, if he does it, he should say lamul. Okay, it happens we don't hold this way, but the Gemara seems to indicate that would be the case. Metive, another question. When you slaughter an animal, you say the bracha ala shchita. So why do you do that? You're about to slaughter the animal. It's not like you've done it already. Hatamnami, hechanema, nema lishchot, lo sagya delav iu shachat. So now they're going to assume, let's say you're talking about a sacrifice. Now, normally, the person who is obligated in the sacrifice isn't the one who's slaughtering it. So he's not commanded. Okay, the, the one who slaughters is not the one who's commanded to fulfill the mitzvah. So again, it's just like the other case. Now they say, Pesach ve'kodeshima ikalememar, but what if, or or forget even uh, sacrificing. You could say the same thing for any animal, right? I, I want to eat meat. I'm commanded to slaughter it, but I'm not the one who's slaughtering it. I asked someone else to do it. So they're doing it for me. So now they say, wait a minute, Pesach v'kodashim ha'yikalamim, but what if I am commanded and I slaughter it myself, right? Sometimes the owner of the Korban Pesach would slaughter it themselves or the owner of the sacrifice. So they say, in achinami, then in fact, you would have to change the bracha to lishchot. Metive, third question, ha'usel lulav latzmo. If you make your own lulav, okay, you put it together, mevarech shachianu v'kiyamanu v'giyanu lazman hazeh. Nitalo latzit bo omer asher kisham tam tzivanu al nitilat lulav. Okay, the first part isn't so important, although it raises a very interesting question. When you put together your lulav, we don't make a shachianu. According to this, you make a shachianu when you put together your lulav. Okay, it's a very interesting thing. Hold off, we're going to talk about this in a minute. When you carry, when you pick it up, latzetbo, to be yotze, the mitzvah, and you pick up your four species, what do you say? Asher ksam sam tzvanu al nitilat lulav. Now again, you're about to fulfill the mitzvah. You haven't fulfilled it yet. So what do they answer? When you lift them up already, you're already yotze the mitzvah. Now this is interesting because we actually do something to avoid this problem. Okay, what do we do? We always hold the, the etrog upside down and then we turn it right side up and we shake it. And that's because we don't want to have this situation where we fulfill the mitzvah first. Okay, but it seems clear that they picked it up 
and fulfill the mitzvah. They didn't necessarily do it in this way. That whole issue comes up later and they say, how could this be? And we should do it in a way that you're not actually fulfilling the mitzvah. We're going to learn about this today, that when you fulfill, you do a bracha on a mitzvah, the idea is always to say the bracha and then fulfill the mitzvah, unless in unique situations when you can't do that like lighting candles Friday night. That's why we cover our eyes. So we shouldn't benefit from the light before we make the blessing, okay? Because you really shouldn't benefit from something before you, you shouldn't, okay, not benefit. You shouldn't fulfill the mitzvah and that's having light until you've made the blessing. There we can't do it because once we make the blessing, we'll accept Shabbat and then we have a problem. Although not everyone accepts Shabbat when they light candles. And then theoretically, men who light candles generally don't accept Shabbat when they light candles. And therefore, they should actually do the reverse. Or on Yom Tov, when you can light, you do it the reverse. But anyway, now we're back to our topic. So it says, let's just assume right now that they would. Okay. And now, by the way, there's a question. If you're supposed to do it over La Siatan, why do we actually do it in this way? Why do we pick it up? Why don't you just say, maybe say the blessing and then pick it up? That's because we want the mitzvah to be accessible to you. If right normally you make, let's say, a Borei Prea Guffin for, you make Kiddush, you're holding the cup in your hand, right? Holding it is important to kind of be connected with the mitzvah. You don't generally say a mitzvah and something's far away from you. So it'd be weird to say the bracha and then, right, and then do it. Some people say, since the mitzvah is really... <clears throat> the shaking of the lulav, that you're not actually fulfilling the mitzvah until you shake it. And that's another potential solution. But in any case, the Gemara here seems to think that you take the lulav and you actually fulfill the mitzvah before you make the blessing. So, ihachi latzeitbo, wait a minute. You can't say that you actually fulfilled the mitzvah before you said the blessing because it says, nitalo latzeitbo. You picked it up in order to fulfill your mitzvah, meaning after you say the blessing. So it should be yatsabo mebaile. It should be right nitalo yatsabo, and then omer baruch hashem Right, you pick it up, you fulfilled your mitzvah, and then you say the bracha. So what do they say? Uh, don't get so hung up on the language. In achinami, really, it means that you were already fulfilled your mitzvah. But umishum de kabayin lemitna seifa leshev basukat taninami reisha latzeitbo. Okay, because the end of it talks about leshev basukat. So because of that, they want to say leshev, so they use latzeit. Okay, it's the same form. Okay, it was just a linguistic thing, a, a parallel structure. How do we see that? De katani seifa. It says after that, how says sukat If you build your own sukkah. Omer Baruch Atah Hashem Shachianu V'Kiyimanu V'Giyanu L'Azman Azeh. You say the bracha Shachianu again. Something we do not do, but it comes up in the Gemara that there were people who said Shachianu on building a sukkah. And then Nichnas Lesheva when you go to sit down, Omer Baruch. Right when you sit in the sukkah on the holiday, you say Baruch Hashem Shacham Tzvanu Lesheva Basuka. So because it wanted to say Nichnas Lesheva, it said Nichnas Latzeva. Here you see this interesting side issue about mitzvah, the bracha of Shechianu and this whole debate about which brachot, is it just lulav and sukkah or is it other mitzvot? The Rambam has a different opinion from others. I'll just read you for a second in the Rambam. The Rambam says, let me just pull it up. Um, the Rambam says that any mitzvah, and as he says, when do we know when you make a Shechianu or not? He says any mitzvah, right? And as the, the Gemara mentions it really with building a sukkah and lulav. And the Rishonim try to figure out what's unique about it. Okay. Um, and maybe it's something that you do every year. Let's say a shofar. You create a shofar. You build it or put it together, you know, kind of shape it or whatever. Fix. I don't know what it means exactly to make a shofar. But you make a shofar and then it's already there for the, forever. So it's not something that's timely. Whereas a sukkah and a lulav is something timely. Um, what about Hanukkah candles? So Hanukkah candles, setting them up, you know, it's not really much to set them up. Maybe making a Hanukkah, but again, you make it once and you don't make it every year. But the Rambam actually includes all of these. And he basically says that anything, that all these things you would actually make a Shechianu on. Okay. Um, and then he basically says that you make a Shechianu when you make it, and then you wouldn't make a Shechianu like you see in the Gemara here when you actually fulfill the mitzvah, right? We make the Shechianu when we fulfill the mitzvah. But here, you don't do it when you fulfill the mitzvah, you do it when you do the action itself. Okay, anyway, a lot of interesting issues that branch off of this about brachot. So now the Gemara says, V'hilchata al biyor chametz. The halacha is that the bracha we use is al biyor chametz. Tekule alma miha meikara, so now they say, wait a minute. 
everyone agreed. So first of all, we we him that Al also means in the future, to do in the future. And therefore, we pass on that we say, I'll be Orchanet. Before we move on, actually, I just want to mention that there's a whole big debate about why some mitzvot we say al and some mitzvot we say le. And there's all different answers given. I'll give you some of the answers. Okay, Tosfot has a whole question about this. Um, the truth is maybe we should go, let's go a little farther and then I'll go back to it. Okay, so now the Gemara continues on and says, um, Lost my place for a second. Right. Okay. Everyone agrees that it's just a matter of what the language al biyor chametz means. Is it future or past? But everyone agrees it's supposed to be on the future because you're supposed to make the bracha before. It's before you do the mitzvah, as I said before. Now, where do we get this from? Minalan. That's what it means. Over lasiatan. Before. Right. So first he says the statement over lasiatan. So now they're going to assume over lasiata means before you do the mitzvah. My mashma dahai over lishantak dumehu. So wait a minute. Where do we get that over means before? Who said that? Amar Rav Nachman Bar Yitzchak. We're going to prove it to you. Damar Kra vayyaratz achimatz derech hakikar vayavor takushi. Okay, here having this description of achimatz. This is in the merit of Avshalom, the rebellion of Avshalom. He runs derech hakikar vayavor takushi, and he passes the kushi. He go, goes before him. Okay. Abai Amar Mehacha v'hu Avar Lifnehem. He quotes it from a different source. This is in Parshat Vayishlach. We're getting too soon. Hu Avar Lifnehem Vayishachu Arza Sheva Pamim Ag Yishto Adichav. Right. Yaakov went before all of his wives and kids and everything he had with him. So again, Avar means to go before. Vi Ba'Adema Mehacha Vayavor Malkam Lifnehem Vashem Berosham. Okay, this is a pasuk from Micha. Allah poreitz lefnehem pertu ve'avru shar ve'etz ubo ve'avor malkam lefnehem b'Hashem b'Rosham. I didn't check the context exactly, but again, ve'avor malkam lefnehem. He goes before them. So you see why they bring all these verses is a good question, um, something to think about. Now, Be'rav Ambre, Be'rav points out there's only there's a little bit of exceptions to this rule. Okay, what are the exceptions to the rule where you don't do the bracha before? Okay, what is it? Chutz mina tefillah v'shofar. Okay, tefillah and shofar. This is interesting because shofar, we do do the bracha before, so you'll see in a minute why. So bishlama, so the Gemara says, I get, I understand tefillah. Da'akate gavar lochaze. What tefillah are we talking about? Well, it's a good question. But let's just explain the Gemara and then I'll tell you the machlok at Rashi Tosfot here. We understand tefillah, why tefillah? You're not, you can't tovo before you say the bracha either because you're impure and you shouldn't make a blessing while you're impure. though that's not so clear cut. And that's why that's Rashi. Rashi thinks any kind of tefillah, if you're impure and you need to tovel, you should say the bracha after. Tosvot says, no, we're only talking about a ger, a convert, because a convert, before they convert, they're not Jewish. They can't make a bracha. I was commanded. They can only do that after they've converted. And then there's a whole debate by women when they go into mikvah. Do we make a distinction? There's a machlok at Poskim and Ashkenazi and Sephardi have different um, minhagim here is the bracha before you tovel or after you tovel. Okay, Ashkenazim actually do some a bit of a combination. They go dunk once, they come out, they dunk again. Many people dunk three times, but they dunk in between. They make the bracha in between the first and the second. Some people say it's a bit of a compromise. Um, so, but the whole debate is: Do we say what we call low plug? We don't distinguish. We kind of. Okay, it says Allah, right? We say by a ger, so we're not going to distinguish by women. We're going to just say the same thing so that people don't get confused by the bracha of tefillah. Other people say, no, it's even, it's just gerim. It has nothing to do with women, and women should actually say the bracha before they go to the mikvah. Okay, so now Ashkenazim actually passed them that they do the bracha first. That's why, you know, the first tefillah is really just to get your hair wet, make sure it goes down. Afterwards, right, then we make the bracha. Sfaradim actually do it after. Okay, so it's an interesting machloket here. But in any case, he says tefillah is an exception. Also note the language. Al ha tefillah, the tefillah we already did. Okay, and then even, it's interesting because women all say al ha tefillah also. But that's because we also paskin in the end that al means the same as li. Okay, then you'd have to say, why do we make this distinction that some say li and some say al? I'll get back to that in a minute. So now they say, um, but shofar, right? Ela shofar, my taima. Maybe you'll make the blessing. You'll try to blow and nothing will come out, right? The sound will be wrong or bad. 
And then we're worried, and maybe that's why you wait to make the blessing after. But they say, But there's all sorts of things that you can mess up. You can mess up your slaughter. You can mess up, right? You could trafe up the animal. You know, you could do the wrong shechita, and then you basically mess up the animal, okay? So, and then you can't eat it. Or mila, brit mila, you can do it incorrectly and, and then miss your opportunity to do it. So, el amar of chista, chutz minat tefillah bilvad. So, Rav Chista fixes it and says, it's only tefillah, not shofar, and that's why we, in fact, say shofar before. Itmar. Okay, now it was said, Tanya nami hachi, there's a brighter to support this. Taval va'ala ba'aliyato omer, baruch ha'sheikh sham sa'atzvanu al ha Right, you went in the mikveh, you come out. When you come out, you say the baruch ha'sheikh sham sa'atzvanu al ha A few interesting things. Tosfo points out at the end of this long Tosfo al ha he starts talking about netilat yadayim. And maybe that's why when we wash our hands, we say ha'sheikh sham sa'atzvanu al ha yadayim in the middle. It's so all different reasons given as to why we do this. In fact, there are some people who do al netilat yadayim earlier. I heard in the name of Rav Shechter that he actually does it before he washes his hands. Some people say that your hands aren't really clean unless you dry them, and that's why you do it in the middle. It's the drying part that's important. Um, anyway, or it could be coming from here that it's a type of tefillah, because it comes from purifying, right? So we don't want to say the blessing until your hands are somewhat clean. Okay, that's one issue. And the other is why certain brachot have al and certain brachot have lit. And there's a bunch of different explanations brought. Um, some are to say, one distinction is to make this distinction between what people, um, what you are supposed to do by yourself and what could be done by a shaliach, like the brit milah, al hamila, and al ashkita, and all those are all because someone theoretically could do it for you, even if you're actually doing it yourself. And ones that you do yourself, like la halik shel shabbat, or Hanukkah, you say yourself. Okay, so that's one thing that... What, all these theories have holes in them. They're not all perfect. That's why there's many different theories about it. Um, I wanted to quote you one more. Um, right. Some people say there's no real guiding principle. Okay. That's quoted in the, by the Re in Tosfo. Okay. That maybe there really is no guiding principle. There was one more I wanted to quote. Um, uh, right. That maybe it's a difference between a mitzvah that you're not absolutely obligated to perform like slaughtering. You don't have to slaughter. For example, you could not eat meat, right? You don't have to slaughter animals. It's not a mitzvah that you have to do. Maybe that's a reason. Anyway, like I said, these are theories and it not, it's very hard to find one that fits all the categories. It could be it just sort of developed that way, you know, and that we have conglomerations from different things that developed over different time periods by different people. And that also could be a, a reason as to why we can't find a clear rule. Okay, last sugi for today, le'or haner. Why do we have to use a candle for b'dika chametz? Menane mile, amar av chista, lamanu mitzia mi mitzia, u mitzia mi chipus, v'chipus mi chipus, v'chipus mi nerov, v'nerov mi ner. Okay, this is a long thing. We're going to learn verses. One verse from another, from another, from another, from another. Okay, we're going to start with, well, we'll go through, if you didn't understand anything, don't worry. We're going to go through each one. Mitzia mi mitzia. Tiv hacha. It says, "Shivat yamim saor lo yimatzei bebatechem." You can't find any leavening in your house. Leaven. Uch tiv hata v'yichapes begadol echel u'bakatan kale. We referred to this the suga the other day. This is um this parsha about when they when Yosef puts the goblet into Benjamin's bag. It says, and then he when he brought the brothers back, v'yichapes begadol echel u'bakatan kale. He started with the oldest, and then he went to the youngest. V'yimtza. Okay, and then it says, and he found. So the finding by Pesach is connected to the finding here. And look what it said there. Right? Then it said, So we see that to find something, you have to search for it. Okay, so there you have. You found it from looking, from searching. That's how you find things. And the whole idea is to find it and get rid of it before Pesach. So now, how do you know how you search? Ah, you have to search with candles. Okay, so here's a verse from, um, this is from Tzfania, okay, one of Treasal, one of the 12 prophets. And it says, I'm going to search Yerushalayim with candles. What it really means is I'm going to search with candles and I'm going to find all the sinners, okay, or all the sins that are being done. So, I'm going to find all the people that aren't believing in God. 
V'nerot miner, and then, now, it says nerot, it sounds like many nerot, but how do we get to one candle? Dechtiv, ner Hashem nishmat adam, chofes kol chad rebaten, and notice it also has chapes here. The ner Hashem is the nishama of a person, and he searches what the insides of everybody. The best way to find it is using one candle. Tana Debei Rabbi Yishmael, we're going to have another source about this that's going to describe it very much in the same way. Lele yodale bod kimet hachamet l'or hanel. Okay, we use a candlelight for this. Even though we don't have a perfect proof in the in the Torah, we have a, re, a reference to it. Shivat yamim se'or la'imatze. Ve'omer, in other words, it says, right? This is, again, all the verses we just saw. Ve'omer, ve'chapes b'gadol echel o b'katan kale. Ve'omer, be'ete yachapes Yerushalayim b'nerot. Ve'omer, ner Hashem nishmat adam. Chofes, etc. My ve'omer, why do you need all these verses? The Brite says. Ve'chitem ahai be'ete hi... Kulahu de Kamarachmana. Maybe when it said, I'm going to check Yerushalayim b'nerot, maybe it's a, it's a leniency. De Kamarachmana lo badik nala bi Yerushalayim b'nehora da avuka, de nafesh nehora tuva. I'm not going to search with a huge torch. Now, part of the issue is here is that you only use one candle. You don't use like a Havdala candle, which has a lot of light. You use just one candle. So maybe Gab is being lenient there. He didn't want to look with a big torch to find everybody because he didn't want to find. He only wanted to find major sinners, not minor things going on. So maybe, right, he didn't want to use an avukah that's so bright. Ela ben nehoret deshraga dezutar. But nehoret tfei, right, um, dezutar nehoret tfei, it's lighter. Da avon raba mishtacha vavon zutar lo mishtacha. Maybe he really didn't want to see so much, right? Maybe using the candle was to not see so much. Tashma, therefore it says, Ne'er Hashem nishmat adam. No, God sees with a candle. A candle is enough for God to see, which means also for us a candle is very good. And in fact, they say that the candle allows you, okay, we're going to see this later, it allows you to get into the cracks and the crevices. You can't get there with a big torch or light something on fire. So that's why we want to use specifically one candle. Okay, we'll end here for today. Shavuot Tov or Shabbat Shalom to everyone. We'll pick up on Sunday.